And speaking of very timely, Janet mentioned that today is the uh, Sunday that uh, around the world we remember, the church remembers the persecuted church. And I will tell you, I told Matthew this this week, I said, I did not, I am not that good that I planned this message for this Sunday because of that. I did not. Even though I'm going to talk about the persecuted church, that is not how I did this. This is like, I wanted to start this series like two or three weeks earlier, and God says, no, not yet, not yet. So I started it when we started it, so that today, for some reason, God wants us to hear this message today. Amen. That's all I'm going to tell you. Um, so today is the day, the International Day of the Persecuted Church. We pray for them. Um, and there are more and more churches around the world and countries around the world and people around the world that are persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They cannot worship freely like you and I worship freely. So we remember them. All right. Um, I would t- one more thing I want to tell you about that before I go on. That so d- noted, the persecuted church, is uh, a group called organization called the Voice of the Martyrs. I'm going to reference that today. The, the, the man who started, the pastor who started Voice of the Martyrs, was a political prisoner in Romania for 14 years during the communist reign of the Soviets. And um, he brought out some things that we're going to talk about today, but he created this organization the voice of the martyrs, because there are martyrs for Jesus Christ even in this day. And that is what this church in Smyrna experienced. So with that, I want to say one other thing about this church is talking about suffering. And while the church had a specific, Jesus said something specific, you are going to suffer and I want you to know that. Okay, He said, I'm going to be with you in it. But the, there, there's persecution because we believe in Jesus Christ that Americans, we've never had to face. But we do face suffering, don't we? Right? We all face suffering. I, I found this quote from Johnny Erickson Tata. If you know anything about her life, <clears throat> she was 17 years old, really athletic, and she was swimming, and she dove into the water, and it was too shallow, didn't know it. She broke her neck, and she's been in, um, uh, paraplegic ever since. She's in a chair. <coughs> But she's done amazing work um, and used her life for the purposes of God. And she has this quote. It says, There are personal struggles and personal suffering that we all face. That is an inevitable part of life, she says. The greatest good suffering can do for me is to increase my capacity for God. And if you ever get to the point where you go, I can't take this anymore, God, add to that, so either you remove this from me, please, or increase my capacity. Open me up, make me larger, make me able to do what I can't do, because I obviously can't do it. I would tell you that's a fair prayer to pray. That's an okay prayer to pray. And I just want to share that with you. All right. Jesus had two churches of seven that he had nothing bad to say about. And this church is one of them, the church at Smyrna. This was a real church. It's a a real church that that is in the area of Turkey. Um, And I'll say this every week. He talks, he says, to the angel of the church at Smyrna, right? Let me just tell you who the angel is. The angel is the messenger of the church. He's writing this to the pastors, okay? He's writing this to the pastors of the churches, and he's saying, you pastors, I need you to tell this message for me. You talk to these people. This is what I'm telling you to say. All right? So that's what Jesus is saying here. So verse 8, Revelation chapter 2, says this. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write, the first and the last, who was dead and has come to life, says this. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Jesus is putting perspective in there. He's saying, understand, this is going to be hard. 
Keep your perspective. This is an internal perspective. You are an eternal person. Keep your perspective. And that's what he told him straight out of the gate. So with that, Smyrna was a specific church in a specific place. But Jesus in these seven churches also gives us prophetic timing. Remember when this was given to John? This was Jesus revealing his glorified self to John at about 90 A.D. So the church age had kind of just started. The church age was about 60 years old at best, right? 30, 33 A.D. is when the church started. That's when the Holy Spirit was given. So the church was very young. And Jesus said to John, let me, t- I'll put it this way, let me tell you what's going to happen. And so he said that. So each of these churches not only were specific, and a message was specific to them, but it was specific to an era in which they would dominate, okay? So the Ephesians church was the, the Ephesus church was the apostolic church, and it was, that era ended with the, with the death of the apostles, okay? That was about 105, 100, 105 A.D., The Smyrna era of the church started in 105 and went all the way for 200 years to 315 when Rome, Rome was the most brutal to Christians during that time period. When you see the the stories of people taken to the Colosseum and they were thrown to the lions, that is when that happened. That is what, what the Romans did to Christians. You're going to believe in Christ? Let me tell you, you've got a choice. You can either renounce it but if you want to continue on with Christ, that is your future. And, and, and 5 million people, by some counts, were martyred during that 200-year period by Rome. Because you had a choice with Rome. See, the Caesars all thought that they were gods. They thought, now, here, this will be, be familiar. The Caesars all thought that they were better than the people they served. I was waiting for it. I was just making sure you're all with me. Sounds familiar. (laughs) The Caesars all thought that they were better. In fact, they thought they were so much better that they demanded worship. You could not claim Jesus is Lord and still say Caesar is Lord. They said, pick one. You pick one. And what would happen is if you said Jesus is Lord and you pick it, here's what they do. They come and take your possessions. Well, you you can't have... The job you have, you can't have the business you have, you can't have the stuff you have, you can't have your home. And they, depending on how brutal it was during those years, they would take your kids and your family and sell you into slavery or put you into prison or or kill you. That is the scenario. That is what that church, the, the Smyrna church faced. Since that time, there has been time for the last 2,000 years when God's people were persecuted. Right now in communist countries, and we're going to talk about this in a second, in communist countries, you cannot openly worship like we are right now. And so with that, Jesus says this to them in verse 9. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. And the reason he told them about poverty, because Smyrna was a very wealthy city. But he says, I know your poverty. He says, the reason I know your poverty is because I know this is all being taken away from you because of your following me. Because you declare that I am Lord. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Jesus recognizes what they were going through, and he says, I understand. Look at verse 10. He says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested. And you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. So, there could have been... Scholars say this. There may have been a time where there was a 10-day period where they were tested in Smyrna. The other piece of this is prophetic, that there was 10 Roman Caesars. Okay, Over that 200-year period, they were Nero, who, where Paul was beheaded, Domitian, where John was exiled for 10 years to the Isle of Patmos. I didn't realize until I started doing this study how long John was on the Isle of Patmos. So you remember, we had Alcatraz, and they'd put you in there, but at least on Alcatraz, they fed you. They would throw prisoners onto Patmos and say, good luck, figure it out. Get your own food, get your own covering, hope you make it. Because what they didn't want was for them to make it, right? So they could throw them out there, and if they died, they died. That was Patmos, and John was there 10 years. Uh, Trajan was... uh, uh, from 104 to 117, Ignatius was burned to the stake. Uh, Marcus Aurelius was uh, where Polycarp was martyred. Then there was uh, Severus, 
Maximinius, Decius, Valerian, Aurelian, and Diocletian. Diocletian was the last of the ten. He was the worst of all. He was brutal to Christian believers. And so that was about a ten-year period that he ruled. And after that, then um, Constantine came. And Constantine said, you know what? We've been persecuting Christians for 200 years, and we haven't killed this thing yet. Why don't we just embrace it? Basically. All right? <clears throat> and so he made Christianity uh, legal. So they quit uh, uh, persecuting the Christians. And there's a whole lot of other church history there that we don't have time to go into this morning. But I, I just wanted to point this out. When we go through stuff, when you go through stuff and I go through stuff, Jesus is well aware, you know? I have prayed the prayer, Jesus, aren't you paying attention? <laughs> right? And, and maybe you have too. I won't ask you to raise your hand. But I'm saying, it's like there's time, God, are you paying attention here? And Jesus is clear to these people, I see what you're going through, and I am paying attention. Right? That's what we see. So he identifies himself as the first and the last, the one who who was alive and, and, and was dead and came back to life. And you go, why did he do that? He said, I want you to know. I want you to know I know what you're facing. You're facing death. And I face death too. And I want you to know I face death and I overcame it. And I'm telling you, the reason he said this, he said, I'm telling you folks in Smyrna, you'll overcome it too. But the thing is, is that death gives us a different perspective, doesn't it? See, death gives us an eternal perspective. And I know there are people who say, yeah, there's nothing happens after your life. Because remember those old, back in the day, back in the day, there was a, a bumper sticker that said, said, he who dies with the most toys wins. And that was never true. And then because the Christians came up and said, he who dies with the most toys still dies. Right? And there, there, this whole thing of death puts us in perspective of eternity. Because I'm not going to live here forever. Right? Have you seen the memes? <laughs> There was one that was really funny. He said, he said uh, Greg, the bass player with, with Jimmy, Greg sent me this. He says, 1993, Jim quit smoking. 1998, Jim quit drinking. 2003, Jim quit eating red meat and started eating bean sprouts. 2000, uh, 2010, Jim started running and working out. 2018, Jim died. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> he still died. <laughs> and I go, oh, that's fun. <laughs> so, death puts us into this perspective of eternity. And there's nothing else that can kind of do that. I don't want to be morbid about it. I don't want to be dark about it. But the truth is, is that one day we will all depart. And the thing we don't know is when that day will be. And so, with that, Jesus says, look, I was alive, they killed me, I came back to life. Keep your hope in eternity. You will live another day. There's life on the other side in me, right? Amen. That's what he's saying. So, there have been times, and there continue to be times, in the 20th century, and even now, that the church was persecuted. persecuted. So, by... Fox's Book of Martyrs, if you've ever read that, and, and we were talking about that Wednesday night, and, and um, somebody brought it up and said about Fox's Book of Martyrs, and I said, I actually don't think I can read it anymore. There was probably a time when I was younger I could read it, but it was so brutal. But f what that book tells about is how brutal it was, and these Christians did not renounce Jesus Christ. So there were five million, by, the, by counts of Fox's Book of Martyrs, who were, per were, were martyred, in that 200-year period, do you know in the 20th century between the Soviets, the Chinese, the Germans, and, and uh, bad communist leaders at large, you know there was over 50 million Christians persecuted and martyred in the 20th century. And with that, it ha you can say, we've gotten better. No, we haven't. If we've gotten better... We'd be more tolerant, right? That's what everybody says. We should be tolerant. That's what they're going for. But you know what happens? They're not tolerant. Because the same thing that the first century church faced, we still face today. Christians around the world face. You either 
You either say the government is right, and we'll tell you what you can worship or what you can't, or if you want to go on your own, that's fine, but understand what you're trading away. And so with that, affliction, tribulation, the things that Jesus talked about here is still prevalent today. So we remember this church, the persecuted church, around the world, because there's still, we'll put it this way, smart churches today being persecuted. Let me tell you about why this happens. People go, why does this happen? If we're serving God, why does bad things happen? When we follow Jesus Christ, we get the same treatment that Jesus got from the devil. Are you with me? Amen. Okay? And that is spiritual warfare. The <coughs> devil hates God. The devil hates Jesus, and he hates you and me. Are you with me? Amen. Some of you have felt his hate, haven't you? Amen. I have felt his hate. And the devil is the source of all of our troubles. And Jesus said this. He said, the devil is going to put some of you in prison. Jesus is calling it out. He said, let me tell you where that's going to come from. So with that, evil, wickedness, horribleness, all of this comes from Satan. It originates in Satan. So Satan, who is Satan? Satan's a fallen angel. He was the premier angel. He was created by God. He was the chief angel in charge of all the angels in heaven. And he held that position until one day he said, I'm going to sit in God's chair. Right? I'm going to have that chair. I'm going to sit right there. And he tried, in essence, we don't have time to go into this either. We do have some on our YouTube channel uh, from our Wednesday night stuff. We've got all this stuff on there. If you want to get deep and wide on it, it's there. But, but basically, Lucifer was his name. And he said, his pride welled up. He said, I can do that. I can do that. And God said, no, you can't. And Lucifer was unrepentant. So Lucifer was known as the shining one. That's basically what his name means, right? The shining one. So the shining one that God created, all of a sudden turned to what? Darkness, because that's where Satan inhabits, right? So everything that he was, he is not now. And everything that he is now is opposed to God. Are you tracking with me? Amen, amen. Okay. So God is what? Love, right? All of You cannot have love without God, can you? <laughs> Satan is all hate. There is no love in him at all. God is truth. The Bible says God is truth. What is Satan? Lies. The truth is not in him. The father of lies. So understand, it's not even a little bit. If God is this much love, Satan is this much hate. All right? Are you with me? So that is the source of all spiritual warfare. Because Satan is opposed to God and he's opposed to you and me and anyone else who says, I will follow Jesus Christ. You want to know where this comes from? That's where this comes from. And so, with that, because there's so much hate, there's so much evil, there's so much wickedness, you go, where does all this come from? How come God hasn't done anything about it? Well, God, we're going to talk about that in a second. Because God's given us a framework. If we would follow that, we put a lot of this stuff down. But we've chosen not to do that anymore. But you look at what happened in Israel 30 days ago. How awful and evil and wicked that was. Where did that come from? It came from the pit of hell. Right? Amen. It came from the pit of hell because Satan hates the Jewish people and he hates Christians and he hates anyone who follows Jesus Christ and he hates God. So where is all this stuff coming from around the world? The devil. The devil. It's actually absolutely where this is coming from. This is coming from the enemy of your soul and mine. This is coming from the devil because, I will tell you, the time is getting near. When God is going to bring justice, people go, why won't God do something? He's getting ready to. Or as they say down south, he's fixing to. Fixing <laughs> to. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's fixing to. He's getting ready to. Because his justice is complete justice. His justice is right justice. And there's still time for people to repent. There's still time for people to repent. God wants his remnant of a church 
to rise up and say, come now to God. Don't wait. Come now. You don't have time to wait because God is moving this thing forward. Are you with me? Satan wants to destroy anything or everything that God has created. Anything that is good, he wants to destroy. Anything that is calm and peaceful, he wants to bring chaos into the midst of. Are you there? Right? If there's calm and if there's chaos in your life, understand where it comes from. Even a little bit. It's Satan trying to throw you off. Okay? So with that, just, just move to where we're at. We're talking about why doesn't God do something? Hate is so ferocious. That was so awful what happened. Well, Satan moves on the hearts of human beings. And human beings have a choice, don't we? Amen. We have a choice to say, that's right and I'm going to embrace it, or that's wrong and I'm going to run from it. God, why does God allow suffering? Because the devil is about to. Okay? Jesus said the devil is about to. And what the devil does is he puts into people's hearts, into people's minds, first of all, the thought, you should do this, right? Hatred goes in there. If you don't have, anyone who does not have the Holy Spirit is going to take that and go, yeah, that's right. Because the Holy Spirit does what? The Holy Spirit connects us to God's thoughts, doesn't it? The only way we get God's thoughts are through the Holy Spirit. And so if we don't have the Holy Spirit, if we don't have a place for God, if we say, no, nah, I don't need God, the three out of ten people you know go, I don't need God. I don't need God. You know, where's all this bad stuff coming from? That's where it's coming from. Now, the unredeemed person does not get God's thoughts. The heart of unredeemed People is evil continually because the unredeemed people don't get God's thoughts. Evil, wickedness, awful atrocities, all those things that happened in Israel 30 days ago, all that stuff that happened in the 20th century, you know where that came from? In the pit of hell. Because there were people in those countries that said, there is no God. Russia says, there is no God. We are atheistic. Theistic being God. A meaning ain't none. (laughs) Ain't none. There is no God. And so that whole country, since the time of its inception, has said, there is no God. That is spiritual warfare. Because Satan's going to tell you there isn't, and the Holy Spirit's going to say, yes, there is. And then the question is, who am I going to believe? It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, doesn't it? You had a choice. God said, don't. And Satan said, oh, that ain't going to happen. She had to choose what to believe. Same thing with us. What are we going to believe? Well, with that, let me tell you, when a country like China, like the Soviet, the old Soviet Union, Russia, or any of these other countries embrace communism as a political party, I'll call it that, right? We have, we have uh, democracy. We have Capitalism. I'm not going all, all political here on you. I just want you to understand where this comes from and how Satan is using what he is using to create chaos in the world today. So we have capitalism. We have democracy. Communism is the opposite of all that, isn't it? Isn't it fascinating that, that, that communism is opposite of capitalism? And there's not even a little bit of in between there, right? Huh. How about that? There's a difference between good and evil. There's not a whole lot of difference in that, right? Isn't that fascinating? So here's what happened. We found this out on Wednesday night. William uh, Richard Wormberg, the founder of the Voice of the Martyrs that we just talked about, was a political prisoner in Romania for 14 years and his wife for three years. He was in that prison and he started to see something he hadn't seen. He started to see that all communism is opposed. Not only a little bit, it's completely opposed to God, to Jesus Christ. And to the point where if they don't believe in him, why are they so mad about it? Right? I mean, if God doesn't exist and they believe that God doesn't exist, how come there's so much up in arms about it? What he found was... That communism, based on Marxism. You all know who Karl Marx was. Anybody study that in high school? 
Any of you young, young ones, they, they tell you any of this stuff in high school about Karl Marx? Oh, ask your dad and mom. Ask, them, ask me, I'll tell you about that. Um, Because I love history. <laughs> Karl, Marx, Karl Marx wrote all these papers that communism is based on. Now understand, communism is a political party. But Marxism is the basis for which that political party exists. Karl Marx, we found it in, in Richard Warmburn's uh, book, which was called um, uh, The Devil, uh, I'm sorry, Karl Marx and the Satanic Roots of Communism. It's still in publication. You can buy that on Amazon. You can buy it on Apple. You can get that book. I read it. I, was, I thought, oh, I'll just get this and listen to it. I'm telling you, I'm listening to this book in the dark as I'm walking last year when we were studying this. It was so dark. It was so awful because he tells what Satanism is because Karl Marx was a Satanist. He was a practicing Satanist. And when you dig, see, they don't tell you that in high school. They tell you, oh, yeah, he was, he was just trying to make it better for working people, and that is not true at all. He was a Satanist, and then Richard Wormburn, in his book, tells what Satanic worship and what that all is, and it was like, I can't listen to this. I had to turn it off. And I go back and listen a little bit more, and it's like, this is awful. It's just awful. And you go, Steve, you're getting soft. I don't think I'm getting soft. It's just like, I can't listen to it. It was so horrible. And that is, Marxism is communism, and communism based in Marxism, because Marxism is Satanism, and you want to know why all that happened? Now you know. That's the nutshell version. Are you tracking with me? Amen. Okay. This is not a political speech. I will not do a political speech, but I want you to understand where does suffering come from, okay? Because the bottom line is this. When you go through the rest of the book of Revelation, you find out that the world in the tribulation period is basically run on the communist political party. You see, what they, you see what's happening, you go, well, that's just communism. And we did, I didn't get it until I read these two books. There was two books. There was that one, the, uh, Karl Marx and the Satanic Roots of Communism by Richard Wormbrand. Sorry. And uh, in 2020, there was a book published, The Devil and Karl Marx. And the same stuff. This guy pulls out some things that Wormbrand didn't find out. It's a thicker book. It's more uh, explicit. And it's like, okay. So all I'm telling you is this. This is spiritual warfare. When the church is persecuted, when people are persecuted, when the church is facing the things it's facing, this is spiritual warfare. This is what we face every day. Are you with me? I haven't lost you, have I? Okay. So, Jesus said, the persecutors are from the synagogue of Satan. You want to know what they tell? So why are they hiding in the synagogue? Right? Why does satanic stuff always hide on the sidelines? Why, why are they hiding in the synagogue? Why are these people who are against that church, why are the people who are about to bring back, bring out bad things on that church hiding in the synagogue? Let's just call the church. Why are they hiding in the church? Huh. I wonder why they're hiding in the church. Because the devil is a liar and a deceiver, isn't he? Come on. The devil is a liar and a deceiver. And he'll make it look like, oh, it's all good. You know, the church is buying into this. How come you're not buying into it? Your church is buying into it. Right? And there's a, I can take that a hundred different places. I won't this morning. We'll get to it. Because Jesus brings this up in some of the other churches. Fascinating to me that the devil was hiding in the synagogue. He's hiding in the church. It's the synagogue of Satan, if you want to put it that. It, it, you know, I'm just trying to bring, bring that parallel there. And Jesus told these people, look what he tells them. read it to you again, and I want to read you something from Psalms. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, thus says the first and the last, the one who was dead and came to life, I know your affliction and poverty, but you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you and you will experience affliction for 10 days. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
Where do you get the crown of life? Where do we get the crown of life? Here or there? There. We get the crown of life there. There's a reward when we go through faithfully here. It's hard. Let me be the first to tell you, it is hard. Because there's times this world will grab us and say, oh, you don't need to go that bad, that deep with it. Just stop. It's not worth it. Jesus is saying it is worth it. Are you with me? What can we do now? What can you do now? What can I do now? I pray. We talk about this pretty openly on Wednesday nights. You think I'm expressive now? Y'all come on Wednesday nights. <laughs> Sometimes we even turn the camera off because we get just like, okay, I probably better turn the camera off. <laughs> I pray we never have to experience that persecution in America. And I come from the 20th century, and I would tell you there was a time in my life I thought we'd never even have this discussion. But here now, unless things turn around, in the United States of America, I would not guarantee you that Christians, true followers, true believers in Jesus Christ, are not going to have to pay some kind of price. Amen. You want to know how I feel? Why I feel that way? Get on social media and some of these famous people who are standing up for Jesus Christ, and all the haters are out trying to cancel them. Trying to cancel them. You don't have a right to talk like that. In fact, remember three years ago, three years ago, just three years ago, three short years ago, they were talking about, they pulled people, they pulled famous people off of social media platforms, didn't they? Not only that, people who held to Christian beliefs, they were going, maybe you don't even have the right to have access to the internet. And they were talking about that at one point. So I'm going, I don't want, I, I just don't want to get all crazy about it. But I'm just going, all right, we're here. I pray we don't. But the remnant church, those who are true followers of Jesus Christ in it right now, who believe, let me put it this way, who believe that the word of God is inspired, unerring, infallible. And that's going to be a smaller group. We'll talk about it another time. Is getting to be a smaller group. That's the remnant church. The remnant church is the one who needs to go out and tell our friends and pray for our family and these people and say, come back to God now. Come back to God now because God's doing something. God's putting his plan forward. He's moving this thing forward. Jesus said, this is going to happen to the Smyrna church. And I'm telling you right now, the word of God is, is when you look at what's going on, God is saying, I'm putting my plan forward. It doesn't matter the day it happens, okay? I don't know what day it's going to happen. Jesus said, be ready. Doesn't matter what day it happens. He said, be ready, which means be ready now. Right? Because yeah. he can wait a long time. You know why he's waiting? He's waiting for people to repent. He wants to give everybody the opportunity to come to him because this is the real deal. We're talking about eternity with him or from him. This is the real deal. That's why he told that church, don't give up. Don't give up. Hang in there. Stay strong. I'm with you. Psalm 145, 17 says this, The Lord is righteous in everything he does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on him. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues him, them. The Lord protects all who love him, but he destroys the wicked. That day is coming when the wicked will be destroyed. So, would you stand with me? Here's what I'd like to do today. On this day that we recognize the persecuted church, take a couple minutes. Here's what I'm asking you to do. 
First of all, we pray and thank him that we can worship freely here today. What a blessing to worship freely here today in this place. But pray for the persecuted Christians around the world that they can endure. Pray for the peace in Jerusalem. Want to know what's going to happen next? Watch the Middle East. Watch Israel. Pray that our country withstands and turns from the evils and returns to God. Pray that our country turns and returns to God. Pray that men and women, people you know, will come to Jesus Christ. That they will return to Jesus Christ. Or they will make Him Lord and Savior for the first time in their life. It is not too late. It is never too late to turn around. Jesus says, turn around and come back. Follow me. If you're not following me, you're going in the wrong direction. Come follow me. Take a minute or two to pray for those things and then we'll close together. Lord, it is very clear by the things we see happening in our country and around the world that you are trying to speak to us. You are trying to let us know to be on alert. You are trying to let us know your plan is moving forward. So, Father, we look to your word as our source of comfort, as our source of perspective, as our source for this world and the next. Help us to see, Lord, there is more than just now. There is eternity. Father, we pray for those people we know in our families, our friends, our co-workers, who need to be ready. We don't bring judgment into their life, Lord. We just want to bring good news to their life. Help us, Father, have those opportunities to share with them. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. We don't come to them in judgment to judge them. We're just coming to them to tell them now is the time to be ready. Because you're moving your plan forward. We want to be in line with you. And life apart from you is always a struggle. Father, we leave this place today. I pray that we'll go knowing we have a work, a mission, a plan to share the good news that you how you've changed our life and to share that with others. They just need that's the best sermon anybody can hear. It's what you've done for us. Help us, Lord. Make us strong, make us hot for you. Help us to be able to do your will in our time. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week.